All right, sorry, we're back on. Hello, Sonny Bonner. Thank you for greeting me again. Um, all right. You remember where we are? I don't mean NYC. I mean what we're doing on, in the evenings. Um, Thursday night, let's have, a, let's have a look at the, do we have this? Thursday night we looked at a passage, okay? And we drew out some meditations or some implications to do with Jesus' resurrection. Friday night we did some apologetics. We looked at some of the, the evidence, very strong evidence, for Jesus' resurrection. And it was meant to instill confidence in us. And I hope it did that for you. Now, tonight we're going to consider some theology of Jesus' resurrection. That's a, that's a big word, okay? Don't be, don't be scared, though. I simply want us to see God's story, including the place of Jesus' resurrection. And my prayer is that we might catch a vision of God and ourselves and the world that matches more closely how God sees things. Now, why is that important? It's important because the truth is we all see life through various lenses. Oh, Gwazi, can I borrow your glasses quickly? Wow, I can't see you properly through this. Okay, but it makes my point. It's kind of like, as you, wow, this is messing up my eyes. <laughs> okay, you take that back. But I think the point's made. Um, think, of it, think of it almost like putting on glasses that change your view and your interpretation of everything around you. Even yourself, how you view other people, how you view this world, how you even view or think about God. And those, those lenses, or those glasses, still messing up my eyes, um, they, they can be anything. And currently, uh, many people are, are encouraged to view the world primarily through things like sexuality, or politics, or race, or economics, or a particular religion, or faith, etc., etc. Those are some of the, the big options doing the rounds at the moment. Now, some of those categories... Are, are good to consider and to have form part of our lives. Some of them aren't. But they are all, all of them are unhelpful when they begin to shape what we see and judge in terms of everything. When they shape everything that we see or how we see it or how we interpret it. In other words, when we only view the world, ourselves, God, whatever, through those lenses. It's an issue because, in short, God wants us to see the story of, of him and us and the world through the dominant lens of his son, Jesus. In other words, he wants us to have Jesus' glasses, if you like, as the only way of properly making sense of life. And crucial to those Jesus' lenses, glasses, and, and seeing God's story properly is Jesus' resurrection. Now, for tonight, I've been, I've been praying and I've been working to try and make things accessible to you. But this will stretch us. And there is much that we could look at, but to, to narrow things down, here is a theme sentence for us. It's coming up shortly. Jesus' resurrection gives us a past to look back to and a future guaranteed to come while we live our present lives. And for those of you are more, who are more visually centered, here is, here is um, that in a kind of a, a visual form. Now, this evening, all that we're going to do is we're going to simply break down that as part of God's story, God's view of things. First, we're going to explore Jesus' resurrection and his past. I'm going to raise two things, and then I'm going to apply it a little bit more. Secondly, we're going to look at Jesus' future, the future elements of the resurrection, and we're going to, again, we're going to raise two points, and then we're going to apply how that future shapes our present. Okay, so look at the past, 
two points, how that shapes our present. Look at the future, two points, how that shapes our present. See Sanke? Hopefully you can see the plan. I see Tandaza and then we'll get stuck in. Father, we, we need your help, not just because of the, the nature of this, but because we are creatures who are in need of your help. And so, please, I ask that you would open our eyes so that we might see, either for the first time or more clearly, you and your ways. I need your help in presenting these things. I pray, please, that I might draw attention faithfully and helpfully to you and your ways in Jesus. Won't you work powerfully in us by your Spirit as we consider this element of your Son's life and death and resurrection and even return? I ask these things in his name. Amen. Amen. So let's begin by examining Jesus' resurrection and his past. And here's the first thing. Here's a word that you may not use very often. Vindication. Think of it like this. Imagine you claimed something. That you, for instance, did or didn't do something. And either way, people said, no, you're wrong. But then what if you could prove your point? Or what if someone with great authority came and said, actually, she's right. In that moment, you would say, I've been... Let's try that again. Okay, mute that section there. I've been vindicated. Okay, in other words, now people know I am right. Jesus' resurrection, listen carefully here, Jesus' resurrection vindicates him. It proves him right. Importantly, before Jesus' resurrection is a word to us, it is first and foremost a word about Jesus. That is so important to realize, mainly because the universe does not revolve around us. In Jesus' resurrection, God defends the claims about Jesus. And it is a triune defense and vindication. It is a declaration from God the Father, God the Spirit, and even God the Son himself. So for instance, in Jesus' resurrection, the Father vindicates his Son's perfect life. Not abandoning his true Son to the grave. Not letting his Holy One see decay. Instead, letting everyone know that he's made his son king over all things. Everyone. In Jesus' resurrection, the Spirit vindicates the claims of Jesus as the anointed Spirit, the appointed Spirit anointed Messiah. And he did this by raising Jesus' body from the dead, as 1 Peter 3.18 on screen says. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Father, Spirit, lastly in Jesus' resurrection, Jesus' own words and actions are vindicated. Three times in Mark's Gospel, Jesus said he would suffer, die, and then be raised again, or rise again. Or as he promised in John chapter 2, verse 19 to 22, Jesus answered, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in three days. Therefore the Jews said, This temple took 46 years to build, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the statement Jesus had made. Jesus' resurrection, it is a vindication of the Father and the Spirit and the Son's work and purposes that are centered on Jesus. And that triune declaration rings out 
built on the foundation of the Old Testament promises. So Romans chapter 1, verses 2 to 4 says, The gospel good news of, of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. What's it about? Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was a descendant of David according to the flesh and was appointed to be the powerful son of God according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. In other words, in Jesus' resurrection, we have, <clears throat> we have conclusive proof that when God gave us shadows and promises long ago in the Old Testament, they come to solid light in Jesus. The descendant of Abraham who would bless all nations. The Passover lamb who would absorb God's wrath. The greater Moses who would rescue his people from, from a greater slavery. The greater Sabbath rest that is needed for our souls and eternity. The true bread from heaven we most need to feed on. And the true king from the line of David who would rule forever. And I could go on and on and on. Promises and types in the Old Testament. But in Jesus' resurrection, we can't get a, a greater sign from the Father and the Spirit and the Son based on the foundations of, of His message and ways in the Old Testament. All of them saying, here is the promised one pointed to from long ago. All Jesus says matters as an exact representation, all that he says, all that he does, matters as an exact representation of God's person and will and character and ways. Jesus' resurrection is the heavenly stamp of approval. And so one that silences all other claims and religions, past and modern, Silenced before God's shout, saying, Here is Jesus, the Son of God, risen from the dead. Listen to Him. Listen to Him. Are we listening to Him? Or are we picking and choosing what we like or dislike? to follow or not follow of what he says. Friends, as we look back, here's the first thing to realize about Jesus' resurrection. It rightly vindicates him. Secondly, overflow. An overflow of life. If Jesus had been an everyday sinner like us, he would have been left to the dead. A tombstone, a fading memory, perhaps some pages in the history books, but that's it. We know that because all rebels against the God, against God, the author of life, carries the death sentence. And it makes sense, actually, if you think about it. If you turn away from life, there's only death remaining. However, in Jesus' earthly life, he never once sinned. Can you imagine? His everyday decisions and words and actions, regardless of circumstances, always saw him in the power of the Spirit, trusting and loving his Father and the others around him, people around him. And so when he is killed, he is killed as the first and only ever truly innocent person to die. And so actually, the only one that death doesn't have a proper claim to. Instead, the only one not deserving of death goes to death. But here's the thing, of course. He goes for us. We each deserve death and judgment for rejecting the God of life. But Jesus faces the death and judgment of billions as he stands in our place. What should be poured out on us is poured out on him. And he is able to do that for everyone because he wasn't only a perfect person, but he is also God 
himself. In John 11, 25, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. He said that before he died. How much more certain is that after his resurrection? Here's the point, in case I lost you. Jesus' resurrection from the dead in the past invites us to welcome Jesus as the one that we must go to for life. He is the overflow of life. How do we know that he is God's overflow of life to all who come to him? How do we know it? We know it by what? His resurrection from the dead. He is the only one to trample death. And now standing, because of that past, as the overflow of life to all who will come to trust in him. Do you know anyone else like him? It is only because God raised Christ from the dead that we can also have newness of life. Now, what does that newness of life look like? Well, for those who look back to Jesus, the same Spirit who rose that Jesus from the dead works in us. He restarts life in us as He restarts our hearts. Not the literal blood-pumping organ, but the very inner us, the office of our affections and desires. He gives us new hearts. He renews us spiritually so that now we can begin to love and live with God as our God. Because at the end of the day, we don't need a facelift, but a heart transplant. And so God gives us new resurrection life, starting from within. To then, by the way, by His grace, be worked out into all the different parts of our lives and how we live. And so Romans chapter 6, verse 8 to 13 says, Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him, because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Death no longer rules over Him. For the death He died, He died to sin once for all time. But the life He lives, He lives to God. So you too consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires and do not offer any parts of it to sin as weapons for unrighteousness, but as those who are alive from the dead, offer yourselves to God and all the parts of yourself to God as weapons for righteousness. For God, life is life that is lived to Him. That's the location of true humanity. That is the point and the place where Jesus rescues us and renews us. Now given life in Jesus, God by the Spirit increasingly works to see us live out the new life that is secured in Jesus by His resurrection from the dead. To live as those now alive in Christ Jesus. Alive because of Jesus' resurrection. You know, this Romans 6 encouragement forms part of us enjoying and walking in the overflow of life that is found in Jesus and in Him alone because of His resurrection. You with me? Now, we've already been applying things, but let me press in further here by talking about how Jesus' past, His resurrection from the dead, can shape our present lives. So our present shaped by that past. Now, remember again, in Jesus' resurrection, we have deep assurance that Jesus is God's word to us. The triune declaration and vindication of Jesus. And in Jesus' resurrection, we have a rich welcome to come to the fountain of life. 
the one who conquered death and overflows with life. And for us to walk in that newness of life. That's what God wants for those who are in Jesus, for his sons and for his daughters. So what would it look like to trust, for us to trust that vindication of life found in Jesus, especially when life is tough? Well, consider this spirit stated assurance in Romans 4 verse 25. He, Jesus, was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Augustine, um, a North African bishop writing in the early 400s, so 1,600 years ago, he says this, should be on screen, just as real is, as is his resurrection, so is our justification. In other words, for those trusting in Jesus, the strength of our right standing with God, that's what justification is, the strength of our right, of our right standing with God is as solid as Jesus' resurrection. resurrection from the dead. Just as real as that is, and we spent an entire sermon last night looking at the evidence for Jesus' resurrection, just as real as that is, so secure is our right standing before God, if we are trusting in Jesus. Friends, reflect on how that past shapes our present. Jesus' resurrection and so our right standing before God if we are in Him isn't like something that is written in the sand at risk of the tide coming in and washing it out. Instead, it is established for the rest of eternity. It is solid because Jesus rose from the dead and he is now alive. Christians here, as certain as Jesus' resurrection, so certain is your right standing with God. It is not at the mercy of the tide of our emotions or our broken minds or bodies, or even our struggles with holiness. When despair or doubt or our struggle with sin batters us, we are encouraged to look back. Did Jesus rise from the dead? Did he? Yes. Amen. He did. Just as real is his resurrection, so is our justification. No matter how weak my faith or my mind or my emotions or my body seems. Some of you really need to hear that. There are a number of you here who struggle with assurance. And you need to hear this. Keep looking back. Keep allowing that past to shape our present living with deep assurance and with a deepening zeal for a holy living out of Jesus' resurrection life. Now, that's the past and our present. Let's look to Jesus' future now. And I realize that sounds weird. This is what I mean. Jesus' resurrection, anchored in the past also proclaims much about the future. It is a secure word from the Father, like an early release of how the story ends. We get an early release of how the story ends. We get to see the full picture. And there is incredible joy and direction here. It is a kind of joy and direction that actually many people in the world are, are looking for, are longing for, are lusting after. In Jesus' resurrection, we have proof of what is coming, even if we can't see it now. Now, what kind of things? What am I talking about? Well, again, let me pick out two elements, judgment and physicality, and then we'll talk about how those can shape us now in the present. So firstly, judgment. With Jesus' resurrection, the Father announces that His Son, Jesus, 
will be the one in charge of judging the world on the last day. Acts chapter 17, verse 31 on screen says, Because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Now, automatically, issue for many of us, judgment. Oh, no, thank you. <laughs> I won't have any tonight. Thank you. But I would suggest that in our best moments, we see the rightness, actually even the goodness, of judgment. When we hear horrific stories of things that are done to others, past or present, if we are feeling things rightly, we long for judgment. When things have been done to us, that shouldn't be done to us. There are moments when we rightly long for justice and judgment. Sometimes there is a God-like cry in the way that we say, Justice! Let wrong be judged! And if sometimes we can rightly desire judgment, how much more so with God? Goodness and purity starts and flows from Him. And so the evil and wickedness of our world, and, and let's be honest, by which I mean the evil and wickedness of us, is an affront to Him. It is an outrage. It claws against His goodness and His good intentions. And so the coming judgment holds God's determination after centuries and ages of patience to close this chapter on our destruction of one another and our world. To put an end to our fundamentally selfish love. Our propensity to curve in on ourselves. You know what I mean by that? Let me explain that, actually. Think, think about it even like this. Even something like our love of other people, which is lovely, right? Is good. It's pure. It, it, like it should be around. It should be happening. But we are so curved in on ourselves. We are so driven by self-love that, for instance, we love people who already love us. Why? Because actually we want them to love us more. Or we love the unlovely because we want to love ourselves more when we say, aren't I so lovely to love that person? So even in some of our purest moments of loving other people, we are curved in on ourselves. We have a fundamental self-love that comes through. We destroy. We destroy our relationship with the God of love. We destroy our relationships with the people we are meant to love. We destroy the people we are meant to love. And we destroy ourselves. Our self-love corrosively eats at us from the inside. God will close this chapter of human history in judgment. But... The one to judge us will not be a stranger to our world and to living in it. It is not like the powerful CEO from his penthouse suite judges the lowest worker. No, the one who judges us will be one who is like us. One like us, except that at every single moment when he had the opportunity to love his father and to love the people around him, he actually did. And so when we come and we moan, God, you don't know what it's like to live my life on earth, to have these human trials and temptations. You don't know what it's like. The father turns and says, have you met Indoda Nayami, my son? He will be handling things. God's judgment is fair at every single point. It cuts off our justifications that are often used to manipulate others and our circumstances. They will not stand before the righteousness of Jesus. 
Will God really judge the world? Look at that verse again. He has given proof of this to all people by raising Jesus from the dead. Friends, tell me, what else would you like God to do to prove that he's serious about this? Of course, there's a flip side to this. For those of us who are hidden in Jesus, joy arises. We deserve judgment. We are part of the problem. But in Jesus, that future judgment has already been carried by him in the past for his people. So that now, in between the past and the future, now we live not as enemies of God who are going to face judgment, but we live as those who are sons and daughters of the Father because of what that son did then. Friends, do, I mean, have you thought about that before? The future judgment is already known because of what has happened in the past. My, my thinking is that, that Christians often take this future fact for granted. Familiarity breeds contempt. Because for all other religions, ATR, Shembe, Islam, whatever it is, for them, the future looms with cloudy uncertainty. Will you be good enough on Judgment Day? No, two weeks ago, I spoke to a PhD student in engineering who is following Shembe, and I asked him that question, and he said to me, I don't know, he says, I need to keep living righteously, then maybe. And I asked him, what if you died manje? What if you died now? How would it go? And he said, I'm not sure. I don't know if I've done enough. Can you see? The coming judgment, and everyone sees the need for the coming judgment, but there's no certainty that exists. Islam, ATR, forms of religious Christianity, the future lacks certainty. But followers of Jesus, the future verdict has already been announced. Judgment paid for in Christ, it reads. Let us rejoice and be glad. This is good news. There is a joyful ending for those who are in Christ. And it is as secure as Jesus' resurrection. So firstly, judgment. Now, secondly, physicality. Professional sport, um, the health and fitness industry. Um, you're, you're all too young now, but when you get older, there is this desire for the vibrancy of youth and youthful bodies. Ask Johannes, okay? He'll tell you. <laughs> He's a doctor as well. He knows all about broken bodies. But friends, here is another part of God's story. The future holds a restored and right physicality. Physicality. A perfection of the Creator's original intention for us existing as holistically physical creatures. Instead of our bodies degenerating... What awaits us is a glorious and perfect regeneration, resurrection. How certain is that future? It is as certain as the resurrection, as, the resurrection, as Jesus' resurrection. When Jesus rose again, we have testimonies like this in Luke chapter 24. Look at my hands and my feet, that it is I, myself, Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you can see I have. Having said this, he showed them his hands and feet. But while they were still amazed and in disbelief because of their joy, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. Friends, when Jesus rose again, he didn't become a spiritual force or ancestor. No, he was of flesh. You could squeeze his arm. 
He even ate with his friends to help them understand this. But it is true. Jesus' post-resurrection body, while still physical, was different. Different how? Well, it was his glorified body. Think of an, an old car that is rusted and falling away. Now imagine that there is a makeover of that old car. Imagine the work done to see it restored beyond the original. Fundamentally, you have the same basic body, but when you look at it, you would also say it is different, glorified, we might say. And it's very similar for Jesus. After his resurrection, he was very much physically similar. And yet, there was this difference of being glorified through the life-giving work of the Holy Spirit. He had a gloriously transformed body. He was a glorious transformed Jesus, the one worthy of trust and faith. Now, why emphasize that? Well, we should, we should emphasize that because Jesus' resurrection is the first fruits. So, 1 Corinthians 15, 23 says, But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Imagine, imagine being a, a farmer. You plant seed in a field and you wait. And you wait. And you wait. But as you walk through the field one day, you come across the first few blades of corn opening up. And yet, the rest of the field? Luto. Nothing. Now, what do you do if you are that farmer? You go get ready in joy because you know what's coming. The first fruits, the first blade of corn is proof of a whole field yet to come. Friends, Jesus' resurrection is the first fruits promise. His resurrection guarantees that all who trust in him will be raised to new life. What kind of life, though? It is bodily and it is physical, just like Jesus' resurrection. It is only with physical and bodily resurrection that we can truly say that death has been swallowed up in victory. Anything less than a physical resurrection for you and for me is not the same as that. Resurrection bodies, ones enacted by the same Spirit who raised Christ from the dead. So Romans 8, 11. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, and by the way, it does if you are trusting in Jesus, then He who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through His Spirit who lives in you. What the Spirit will do then is He will perfect the salvation that is found in Jesus. Remember, He started the work from the inside and when Jesus returns, that work will be completed, will be perfected, even including the outside of us. New hearts, new bodies. And friends, here we have to keep thinking big picture. Actually, it's not just about you and I. There is much more to God's purposes. You remember I already said our future form isn't ghostly, it's physical. But did you know that our future home isn't actually heaven per se, but the new creation? This world restored. So Romans chapter 8 the rest of it says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subject, subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits, 
We also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Contrary to so much pie-in-the-sky religion that wants to either dissolve us into nothing or deny our right desire for physicality, contrary to that, Romans 8 reminds us that part of God's ultimate in aim involves... Did you see in the, in the last verse there? Not the destruction of our bodies, but the redemption of them. We groan for that. But here's the point. So does the creation. Like us, it is tired of the sinful ravages leading to crumbling and decay. The creation groans. Desiring instead the recreation of this world. Restoration. Renewal. But that, says Romans 8, is tied to the redemption of the bodies of Jesus' people. Our resurrection. Jesus' resurrection, his own restored physicality, is a loud hailer from God signaling his physical intentions for his people, but also for his creation. Friends, the return of the resurrected Jesus brings a new and glorious chapter. God's people, those in Jesus no longer under judgment, in God's place, this world restored, enjoying God himself. But doing it in perfected physicality. One that is guaranteed by what? Jesus' resurrection. Let's end here. How should that future shape our present? If you spent time, I'm sorry, not if you have, you have, you have spent time in 1 Corinthians 15 these last few days. And I'm so glad you did. Um, although I wish those headings had been taken out before it had gone to you. It's like cheat notes. You guys should have to redo this all from another language, maybe, you know, Greek or something like that. I don't know. Anyway, 1 Corinthians 15 bursts with the good news of Jesus' resurrection. Of the resurrection as essential to the Christian faith, remember, no resurrection, no Christianity. Of our resurrection secured by Jesus' resurrection, and actually of the nature of the resurrection body, what it will be like. But then it ends by talking about the victory of the resurrection, of death being swallowed up. And here is how it finally ends, verse 58. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And this is what fascinates me. It is clear from the context, both from chapter 15 and also chapter 16, what the work of the Lord is. Do you see it there? you see that, that phrase over there, the work of the Lord? The work of the Lord, the labor in the Lord, is anything that promotes the news of Jesus. Perhaps in our actions, as we love and serve, but actually, especially in what we say. And it's that last part that fascinates me. Listen to this. Because of Jesus' resurrection, dead people get raised to life with words. I'll say that again. Because of Jesus' resurrection, dead people get raised to life with words. Think about it. That is how people come to trust in the vindicated Jesus and the life that is found in him, right? They come to trust in him through words, through us speaking about Jesus. God the Father, by the Spirit, works through the message about his resurrected Son to bring life. Because of Jesus' resurrection, dead people get raised to life. Speech about Jesus is not vain, it is not unproductive, it is not empty, it is not fruitless. 
Why? Because Jesus rose from the dead, sits at the right hand of the Father, and he is calling people to himself right now through our verbal witness, our words. Isn't that extraordinary? And so we are encouraged to introduce people to God's story and to talk about Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And how actually that fulfills our deepest desires. And how that also rebukes us. It stops us in our tracks. Because it asks us to first recognize our sin before we can become saints. With a confident past and a guaranteed future. And I want to encourage you, who from your family can you speak to? Who from your work colleagues can you speak to? Who from the people that you are in lectures with can you speak to? Remember Jesus' resurrection, especially what is to come, and speak. Speak to unbelievers. Speak also to believers. This is also part of the work of the Lord. We encourage fellow brothers and sisters to grow up in the goodness of Jesus. I'm almost done. Perhaps when we encourage one another that the glorious future to come means that we don't have to grasp and grapple for so much earthly glory now. A good reputation, wealth, position, titles, knowledge, degrees, or even some kind of plain victory. We don't need to seek those as strongly now or to hold on to them as tightly now. We need to counter the messages of media and campus life with the good news of Jesus' resurrection and especially of this guaranteed future. Or perhaps because of the physical future tied to Jesus' resurrection, we encourage one another that life now in the body matters. A body, by the way, that has been bought by Jesus and is indwelt by God's own spirit and waits one day to be glorified. And so perhaps we say to one another, are you doing something with your body that is ill-fitting for those whose future is so glorious and so physical. Are you? The resurrected Jesus will return in judgment and with him the perfecting of the salvation that is found in him. Friends, we know what God is doing. He is giving life to those in Christ now and he will perfect it when Jesus returns. And we are encouraged to give ourselves fully to the work of calling men and women to faith in Christ and to the work of ensuring that they remain in Christ. And doing that as we speak about and live out the reality of God's story and the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That is for all Christians, not just me. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, because, that you, because you know your labor in the Lord is not in vain. He rose from the dead, friends. He is alive right now. Father, we praise you. We praise you for the life that you have given to us in Jesus or that you offer to us in Jesus. And we praise you that you have made the story, the reality of you and your ways known to us. You have told us about our past. You have told us about our future. And we praise you for that and for including us in your workings and your ways in Jesus by the Spirit. We praise you and we thank you. In the name of the Jesus, resurrected and returning. Amen.